some of you has uh, put in the comments on the case management manual chapter three, they would like to know a little more on diagnostics. So this is one of the important uh, aspects. And uh, today uh, we would like to quickly review the recommendations and compare RDT and light microscopy. Maybe I mentioned something about PCR and molecular based techniques. Tell you about um, recent uh, changes in the market and most important, how do we select a good RDT? What methods do we have in place? And so what are the quality assessment systems? And then um, we will have a quick video a quiz about how to perform and interpret a good RDT. So uh, I, I'm asking you, what is this uh, instrument? If you can put in the chat box, can you let me know? Uh, what, is, what is being used? Can you see um, on the photo, what is this uh, little um, plastic? instrument. Inverted cup, Dr. Salahuddin, thank you very much. This is the most precise way of uh, taking blood from a finger prick because uh, it, it really has a very specific uh, uh, um, volume and so is if you can uh, when you select RDT, select uh, what we call ancillary items, this is the really the best uh, blood collection device. Okay, thank you for this. Uh, trying to move to the next. Um, this is maybe something we all know, is basically everybody should get a test before being treated and um, early diagnosis and uh, should be done with uh, either microscopy or a malaria rapid diagnostic test. And uh, when we compare the two, these are very equivalent uh, in terms of diagnostic performance. For instance, if we have a poor quality RDT and very poor quality microscopy, they can only detect a very high level of parasite density. This is probably uh, above 500 parasites per microliter. Now, if we have uh, a good uh, RDTs and good quality microscopy, now the detection goes down to 50, 60 parasites per microliter. And uh, if you go to PCR, we can get to one, two uh, with conventional PCR. We can even go a hundred times uh, below these levels if we use uh, the highly sensitive uh, PCR, high volume PCR. And uh, we don't need uh, this level of uh, detection for malaria infection because we have a lot of studies which have shown that uh, for uh, patients when they come to health facilities, they, most of them, they have 200 parasites and above. So a good quality RDT or a good quality microscopist, they can detect this level of parasitemia. PCR at the moment is maybe good for molecular-based studies like on transmission, which, which are done for research for very specific needs, but not for clinical management of malaria. And uh, when we look at uh, the evidence, um, there has been a very, uh, basically, um, uh, thorough and very complete assessment of studies comparing microscopy and RDTs. And this is the analysis of 94 eligible studies which were analyzed in a Cochrane review and shows that um, the HRP2 tests uh, have a 95% sensitivity and around 95% specificity. 
if we use a PLDH test, the sensitivity is a little less, 93%, but the specificity goes up to 98%. But in both cases, this is very, very high. Can somebody tell me in the chat box uh, why do we have a, a little better specificity with the PLDH-based test? Maybe not Dr. Salahuddin, he may know the reply, but is there somebody who wants to just venture? Why, why do we have a, um, a little better specificity with the PLDH-based test? Um, we will go very much in detail in this in the next presentation, not today, but um, I want to just to quickly assess if you, if you knew it. Nobody, I don't see a reply. So let me move to the next. Uh, this is uh, basically which are the roles for both RDTs and microscopy. I just want to show you that for certain functions, microscopy is much better. For instance, in a hospital, if I want to follow up some patients with severe malaria, microscopy is really the type of lab test I need to use. Or if I have somebody which has been already treated with malaria and is coming back and I have a suspicion maybe treatment failure, then I need to use again microscopy. So this is the two very specific functions for which we really have no doubt microscopy is better than uh, RDTs. And uh, when we look at uh, the number of tests performed, uh, this is for the whole of uh, Africa. RDTs uh, are uh, probably around 80% of all tests, and in blue here, you have the microscope. If we look at what, what percentage of people gets a test when they go to different facilities, um, a good amount when they go to the public health facilities, they get a test. This is all across Africa, so may not be fully applicable to your countries, but these are average figures. But if we go to Community health workers also, they're pretty high, quite good. If you go to some formal private healthcare facility, like a, a private hospital, a private um, clinic, they also are quite good. I would say similar to public sector. But uh, if I go to other health facilities in the private sector, um, including like uh, pharmacies uh, or accredited stores, uh, very few people have uh, getting a test in the, in the formal private sector is extremely rare. So this is uh, still a big problem. A lot of people which goes in the private sector, they get anti-malaria without any form of testing. And this is what is happening in terms of uh, big orders. Um, these are uh, for the whole of, um, uh, let's say the latest uh, figures of sales. These are the PFALCIPARAM only test sold in Africa, and these are the combo test sold in Africa. This is from the manufacturer selling data. This is outside Africa. So you see that the largest uh, consumption and use of the test, uh, malaria RDTs, is in African countries. And these are the figures of uh, how much the malaria programs report back to WHO that they are distributing. So this is manufacturer data, this, and this is the program data, and a uh, little, little less in terms of distribution, but very similar. Most of the tests are for detecting falciparum, especially in Africa. And this is a, um, a, just a very quick summary of what are the major determinants of quality and showing a comparison between microscopy and RDTs. So when 
we look at which factors are affecting the performance of the test for the RDTs is really the product selection is most important compared to any other parameters like uh, how it has been stored and maintained in health facilities, the training capacity of health workers. These are really important always, but not as important in terms of which test is it um, purchased and distributed and becomes available. Now look at microscopy. This is just to give you the difference. In microscopy, the major determinant is the performance of the test by the health workers. And it's not so much the type of microscope or the type of blood slides that or GIMSA, et cetera, which is being purchased. It's really the competence and the performance of the microscopist. And this will be also what we will discuss in the next presentation. Let us go a little bit on the RDTs more in detail. This is the uh, buffer solution. This is a typical cassette. This is a, another type of blood collection device. This is, of course, you know, the Lancet and the alcohol swab. And the WHO has a system to do periodic evaluation of the performance of this test. And so far, up to 2018, the WHO has done eight rounds of assessment and more than 327 RDTs have been assessed. And this as unique products. And this is interesting because when you go into the, a clinical outpatient setting and you do a um, test on any of these patients, could be a child or an adult, uh, uh, different age groups, uh, they will have different parasite densities and also different level of the parasite antigens, which this test is detecting. And uh, when you need to compare different tests, uh, if you, first, you cannot do on the same patients uh, multiple finger pricks to assess at the same time many, many different RDTs. So most of the evaluation is done in the lab, is using some samples which are all characterized. They are calibrated to have a certain parasite density and there is a high and a low parasite density and also very well characterized antigen concentration. And the system is quite elaborate. I will not enter into the detail, but for each test, there are assessment of done is done in two lots. And from each lot, two different tests are evaluated. And these are read in a different way independently from by two lab technicians. And uh, each process is then repeated uh, multiple times uh, on different samples of uh, plasmodium falciparum. In case of falciparum is around 100 different samples, in case of Vivax is around 40. And uh, for uh, samples to be called detected, we have uh, all four readings uh, needs to be positive at the same time. So even if uh, in this uh, different examination, there are many positive uh, cases and uh, um, we could have uh, a positivity rate which is quite high, when we evaluate the RDTs, uh, we look at only results in which for one samples, all test as a result positive. So in this case, and this is what we call panel detection score, it is only 33%. Why I'm telling you all this? It's, it's, it's to give you some understanding what is behind this complex data, which is the way we compare different type of RDTs. These are all brand, completely different from one the other. 
And you see that some of them have a panel detection score which is above 75%. It doesn't mean that this is the positivity rate at 75%. It is the way calculated in a very elaborate way that on 100 samples of plasmodium falciparum in the lab, this test has given 75% four positive readings. Um, I don't know if Lee, Lina, you can go into the, looking at the list of participants and maybe making somebody mute if possible. And, and the same is done also for the Vivax detecting test. You see in green is those which are here above the 75% detection rate. So we have many tests, bottom line, which can detect very well falciparum and also IVAX malaria. Now, this performance evaluation, which we call it product testing, is one of the three components of the WHO prequalification. WHO prequalification is now the main uh, basis uh, to select uh, good uh, performing RDTs. And this is uh, often selected by the Global Fund to make decisions, uh, but also from uh, UNICEF, WHO, and other, other funding agencies. So the prequalification looks at uh, a product dossier. They look at the results of the product testing in the lab, the one I presented to you. And they also send some inspector, inspectors to the a company, manufacturing sites, and they make an evaluation of the uh, quality system which are in place. And uh, based on this, um, there is a decision and a listing of products uh, on the PQ list. We call it the PQ list. At the moment, there are 22 malaria RDTs which are pre-qualified. They are produced by eight different companies. And if you go on this and click on this link, then you can get to the page and select and see which one are quality test. Another way of assessing quality is what we call it um, lot testing. Uh, lot testing is uh, to analyze in the lab if a certain batch of RDTs, when they are purchased, they also are uh, detecting well uh, parasite at different, uh, it's the same, 200 parasites and 2,000 parasites. And uh, this is something that many procurers are doing when, before shipping the RDTs to the country. So there is also this lot testing uh, procedure. Also, if you uh, are in the field and you start to find some uh, strange unexpected findings. For instance, a lot of positive uh, RDTs in a place where normally it's the positivity rate is very low, or you suddenly see that the RDTs, uh, the health workers say they don't work anymore. They don't detect malaria, but the microscope is working and they detect parasites. It's possible to take some of these uh, tests in some boxes and send them to the WHO collaborating center in the Philippines where they are being tested through this procedure. And um, when they receive the test, after five working days, they are able to give the results and it is free of charge. So it's something to consider if there is any uh, concern from the field that the RDTs may not be working. And when you send it to this lot testing lab, but they also will make in the report uh, some uh, photos in case they see RDTs which are not working well. And these are all examples of very strange uh, findings that certainly show that there is a problem with the RDT. So this will be also available in the report. So now, I would like to switch uh, to another uh, um, quick, uh, uh, let's say, brief video for you. Um, and I hope it's going to work. Um, and uh, it will be on how to do the RDTs. If we were together, we will do this uh, physically on the table 
between us, but uh, it's not possible. So let me give you three minutes of a video before showing you uh, some interpretation of uh, doing an RDT. Um, let us see again. Use the loop to put the drop of blood into the sample well marked A. Make sure that the blood is absorbed by the pad at the base of the hole. It should not be deposited on the plastic edges of the well. An easy way to deposit the blood in the correct place is to push the loop vertically into the well until it touches the pad at the base. Push down slightly so that the larger part of its surface touches the pen. Take care that blood does not flick up when pushing the device. Discard the loop in the sharps box immediately. Do not place it on the table or elsewhere before discarding it. I hope you're able to see it. I go to our next one. Yes, it was great. Uh, the voice is very clear. Hold the buffer solution bottle vertically and put the exact number of drops specified in the instructions in the buffer well Mark B. In this example, we shall use two drops. Count the number of drops carefully. It is important to add the exact number of drops. And now the third one. Wait for a correct period of time after adding the buffer before reading the test results. In this example, wait for 20 minutes. The health worker added the buffer at 9 o'clock. She will be able to read the results after 20 minutes. She will be able to read the results when it is 20 past 9. While you wait, you can see that the blood is beginning to wick up the strip. It is disappearing from the sample well A and beginning to appear in the rectangular results window. Then the blood also disappears from the results window. It will leave only the control line and if the test is positive, a line in the test window T. Once the buffer has been added, it is no longer necessary to wear the gloves. Take off the gloves and put them in the non sharps container. Then wait to read the test results. Thank you. I'm going back to my uh, PowerPoint slide. Can you see back the PowerPoint now? Can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet, but it will come. Okay, I hope. If, if it's freezing, I don't know. Can you see the PowerPoint or not yes, yet? Yes, now. Now, yes. good. So there is a latency between us. So that makes yeah, yes. So you, you saw very nicely the video which was showing us uh, we put the blood in this uh, well A and the buffer solution in uh, the well B. And this is followed by a migration along the nitrocellulose strip, uh, which is why we call it an immunolateral flow assay. So it's a flow assay, okay? And uh, this is called the 
test window and this is the control window. And if there is no line here, the test is negative. Now, let us see, this is a combo test. So it's not um, as simple as the one you saw in the training video. This type of test, the combo test will have two lines uh, in the test window. So something interesting for you, because now we're going to have also a little quiz by Lina, always with Slido. And we want to be able to recognize the different type of results. Now, this is a PFPAN test. And by convention, the first PF is the one which is closer in terms of line to the control line. So when we have one line only in the test window, which is close to the control line, this is a falciparum result. And look at this. Even if, even if the line is very, very, very thin, for malaria test, this is a positive test. It's, it, this is different from an HIV test. If an HIV uh, RDT has this type of results, uh, the manufacturer will ask to repeat the test. But for malaria, this is a positive test, okay? Now look at this result here. Um, if there is only one test line, and this is very far from uh, the control line, this is uh, the PAN line without the falciparum line. It means that it is a malaria positive, but there is no falciparum. So we call it a non-falciparum result. It could be vivax, ovale, or malarie, or a mixture of one of these three. In many of your countries, you have vivax malaria. So that's the most likely results for you. And here is where a lot of programs have, uh, let's say, difficulty, and a lot of health workers got some mistakes. When you have two lines in the test window, this could be a falciparum infection or a mixed infection, which have a falciparum plus another species, generally is vivax. This is not a mixed infection by default because, because um, the PAN line, which is this one, it can also be activated by falciparum parasite. So sometimes falciparum alone can be like this, or sometimes a falciparum result could be like this. And we need to classify this as a falciparum mono-infection or mixed. We, we cannot make a difference. If it is like this, it definitely is a falciparum infection, no doubt. But sometimes, uh, often because the parasite density is a little bit higher or the antigen load is higher, the, it's, both lines will be positive also in case of a falciparum mono-infection. So it could be two different type of results. I remember in many countries like Burundi, um, they started to introduce combo tests and they have like an epidemic of mixed infection. And uh, this was really not detected before. And simply because many health workers were misclassifying this result as a mixed infection. But it could be either falciparum mono infection or mixed infection. Okay. Angela, just to, to support what, what we said, we had the same in our countries also. If you go to World Malaria Report, we suddenly you see there is increase in mixed infection in some countries. And then the reason was exactly what, what you mentioned. I mean, that's the, we had in Pakistan also, for example. I mean, that we had in Afghanistan suddenly increased in a huge proportion of mixed infection. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Postman, I also had here, uh, it happens also with us in Bosaso, but uh, there was a lot of confusion. Then we sent uh, 95, two batches, 95 samples uh, with, with, with two lines to Cambria and to also uh, Camro 3. 
and another batch of 45, and all of them tend to be single falciparum uh, positive, not a mixed over. Yes, yes, very good. Uh, somebody is writing, uh, uh, this is very confusing for the health workers. How can they differentiate between falciparum and mixed infection? Unfortunately, this test uh, cannot make it because it's a PF pun. If you have a PFPV test, which I know some of your countries have, uh, PFPV is very clear because uh, you will know that uh, it is, uh, if there are two lines, uh, one is for PF and the other one is for PV. Unfortunately, the PFPV test will be missing some ovale and some malaria, but these are very rare infections. And uh, sometimes, uh, not, I would say, a major public health uh, risk in missing them. But with this type of test, uh, this is the correct way of recording the results, something to remember. Now, another possible result um, is uh, invalid. Invalid, there is no <coughs> control line, and even, even if you have uh, the uh, two test line or one test line, if there is no control line, the test is invalid. There is something wrong with this test and it needs to be repeated. If I have a result like this falciparum, I have a falciparum. I don't need to confirm anything. I have a very, if I know, if, if I have a result uh, like this, I can say also, I am, I'm very clear. I know that uh, this is a non-falciparum malaria. Uh, it could be Vivax. And uh, I may decide, if I know that in my country I don't have any plasmodium malaria, maybe this needs primaquine as well. It could be ACT plus primaquine. Now, if I have a result like this, uh, and I would like to know if it is really Vivax uh, or a P falciparum and P Vivax infection, then maybe it's good to have a, a microscopic examination. But this is only if you have a primaquine to give. If you don't have any primaquine, what is the point of knowing that this is a, a mixed infection? You give an ACT. The patient, unfortunately, if it is a Vivax also infection, he may come later with a relapse and you may they need to think about maybe this, this person was a mixed infection, but Ciparum Vivax. Uh, maybe at that time you want to go for microscope directly. So uh, I hope this is clear. The microscope itself is not wonderful for uh, uh, mixed infection. It, it really requires very good skills and uh, some, I would say many, mixed infection under microscopy may be missed and detected only by PCR. So I would say that uh, if you have a doubt and you can, in this case, maybe you need to give uh, primaquine, you have primaquine available, then it may be good to check with a microscope uh, and somebody which really can make uh, diagnosis of mixed infection. It's, uh, it's probably you need to send it to a good lab to make this analysis. I think these are the three types of results. Negative, very clear. Invalid and positive, we have different possibilities. It'll be a little bit more quick, and, but you have the presentation with you. And we will look into the diagnostic performance of microscopy and what are the major uh, determinants. Very important uh, uh, instrument and extremely precious, but uh, often is not well, well done. It's not, uh, uh, it has a lot of complexities and the results are not very reliable. And we will describe some of the resources that we have uh, for quality assurance. And uh, this is a study from Tanzania, which shows uh, 
made a problem with the results. Uh, they took uh, uh, slides which were already assessed in the field in routine health facilities and they did a second reading and they were 70% false positive. So a lot of what was declared malaria in the health facilities when you reconfirm in by very, let's say, um, competent microscopist, uh, in this study they found it was not good. But uh, also in the United States of America, so it's not a resource limited country, uh, there is a lot of problems with microscopy. So if you look at here, out of the whole country, all the labs which were reporting at 150, uh, maybe only 33, they use GIMSA. And uh, very few count more than 300 high power fields or more than 500 red blood cells. And this is really a very low uh, examination of the thin film. It's not uh, at all adequate. And uh, if you look at also those which are giving results within 24 hours, is extremely low. Those which are able to report species in the United States of America in very, very low, like five out of 149, extremely low. So it's problematic everywhere in malaria endemic countries and in non malaria endemic countries. And uh, it's important to remember that there is a lot of tests which are done uh, by, um, for malaria diagnosis. If we look in the world, uh, in 2016 and 2017, there were more microscopy slides examined than RDT performed. So on the global scale, and some countries like India, they are really very into microscopy instead of RDTs. And the microscopy has many issues when it comes to performance. And then, one is clearly how the lab technician has been selected by the school of lab technicians, how he has been trained, how it's been assessed, and all this really enters into the competence. But there is also a lot of issues around the like supervision and are they being checked on a regular basis? What about the quality of the GIMSA? which is sometimes problematic, and even the slides which are available. Do they have the right operating procedures? Do they receive regularly all the supplies in time and they can perform so with quality as equipment and quality supplies? And also the work environment. Do they have so many slides to examine per day that uh, is actually not possible to do a proper examination. Now, uh, one slide will require at least 10 minutes uh, to do a very good examination of the thick film and the thin film. And we know that uh, in a busy lab, uh, sometimes it's one minute, sometimes it's even less. So uh, in one minute, one can miss uh, a lot of parasites in, in, the, in the blood examination. This is just to tell you, we have several good resources and we have training materials. We have a CD-ROM and we will have an assignments with the CD-ROM. We have bench aids, which are very good material for the lab technician to keep in the lab. And we have a manual for quality assurance of microscopy. And in this manual, it describes at different levels what needs to be done to have. And the in the in any system in any country there needs to be a core group of microscopies which should uh, be assessed and certified using an external competency assessment and this should be really the core group that we know are normally in the national reference lab they are recognized as the microscopy level one or basically experts in malaria diagnosis. We will review a little bit what this implies because it's a key activity in many of your countries. 
Now, this manual has a lot of new things uh, and uh, like uh, internal quality control la, uh, as, uh, procedures. Uh, there is also what um, countries uh, should do in, for their own microscope in terms of national competency assessment. A special type of uh, supervision, which we call uh, outreach, training, and supervision, and supportive supervision, or TSS, which is very interesting because uh, the supervisor is also becomes like a coach and they provide the training while they do the supervision. It's not just to assess that everything is going well or not well, but also to support the microscopy. And also it describes what we call proficiency testing, which is also another way of assessing the quality. So we have many different approach to improve the quality of the microscopist. One thing which is uh, available and important because with uh, Dr. Kazem we are working on the Arabic translation of these documents is a series of standard operating procedures which are very detailed on each step that the lab technician should know and they should really have uh, in available and just to refresh. So these are available on a website, the English version, and soon we will be uh, finalizing the Arabic versions as well. One thing that we basically promote as WHO is the external competency assessment of malaria microscopists. So this is a, a system that um, we perform is like an examination of the microscopist so it's a formal assessment to see competence and to see they can detect if the parasite uh, uh, is present or no parasite seen, what is the species and what is the parasite count. And according to their capacity uh, to detect uh, correctly a certain number of slides, they are put in four different level of competence. So level one is really high level, and level four, basically they need retraining. Basically major problem have been identified. And the, the way it works is, is like they are exposed to a series of slides on a different days, and they, they need to be able to recognize positivity, species, and parasite densities. And these slides are very well characterized by WHO, and they're used in all competency assessment workshops in the world, everywhere. So a microscopist level one in Sudan is as good as level one microscopy in Thailand or Philippines or India, it doesn't matter. So that's very important in terms of, uh, let's say, assessing the level of competence. They get a certificate if they're level one and level two, and, and definitely there is a series of uh, tasks that then they are allowed to perform. Now, we reviewed, uh, there's been a lot of uh, experience, more than 200 workshops uh, done in the world. Uh, so more than uh, probably 2,000 uh, microscopists, uh, uh, probably more 2,500 microscopy has been assessed uh, over the years. And uh, one uh, big discussion has been, do, do we need before these uh, workshops to refresh the, uh, basically do a refresher training. And uh, there was a publication by the Americans. They showed that uh, in many African uh, workshops, uh, when they were doing a refresher training and you evaluate uh, the level of uh, the microscopist, those workshops where you have done a workshop, a refresher training, you clearly see that they have a better level. So they are, uh, they're, they're their final results are much better. So we took all of the results of all the workshop done so far, we make an analysis and try to see those which did not have a refresher training compared to those which have a refresher training, 
look at parasite detection, species identification, parasite counting, there is some little improvement if they have done a refresher training, but when you do some statistics and analysis, it's not significant. So a lot really depends on the contents of the refresher training. And uh, that's where probably there is a lot of uh, heterogeneity, so a lot of noise, and the results are not always consistent in showing that it's good to do refresher training. And since it is uh, doubling the cost uh, of uh, the uh, external competence assessment, it, we are still not clear it is a good uh, investment to do. Also, what we did, this was uh, more than one year ago, we reviewed all the e-learning tools that we have uh, for malaria microscopists. And uh, two of them, we reviewed more in detail. One is a CD-ROM, which is available on WHO website, you can download. And the second is a um, new e-learning course, uh, which is all available on a memory stick. So this is very interesting and is going to be used uh, in Sudan very soon. Uh, so very interesting experience, uh, which if it goes all well, which we expect uh, may be extended to other countries and very relevant today because again of the limitation in doing face-to-face -face, uh, training. So uh, this is a um, um, training course which has been developed by AMREF, Health Africa, with different partners. It um, has 40 hours of training and uh, it has uh, inside the course uh, like a virtual microscope. Uh, so extremely interesting. It's possible to see a very nice image. This is a Vivax parasite and then to use the arrow keys up and down like you are moving the micrometer of the microscope to put on focus the, the image. So there are also demonstration videos and there is um, a sort of a pre and post test. At the end, if the participants are good, they get a certificate. So the course uh, has a component online, uh, just I think for the registration, but once they are registered and the participants get the memory stick, they can uh, do the course offline and they can connect uh, at the end to get the final verification and the certification that will require the connection, the connectivity. So very interesting, uh, and as I said, uh, maybe Dr. Kassem, you may like to say a few words uh, about the experience, what is being planned for Sudan, uh, for the other participants to know as well. Just to say that these are the contributors and uh, uh, not very expensive, very interesting and very needed now uh, because of, as I said, we need to use more tools and approaches for training which are at distance, at least until the COVID pandemic will be over.